Thanks for sticking it out. Yes, that was what I was looking for. Thanks for sticking it out all the way to, um, to here. Um, I wanna, there's, there's been quite a bit of uh, requests um, from, from customers um, asking us to, um, to talk a bit about um, what is actually the real physical layout of your data centers. Um, tell us about your networks and things like that. And we, we've never told, we never talked that much about it. Um, and that's something that I would like to do here at the end of uh, to today, kind of lift up sort of the skirt of the, uh, of, of the secretness around uh, our networking and data centers and things like that. Um, first, I want to touch on, on something else. So what I think, what I think is sets Amazon or AWS aside from other providers. I think we already talked about this this morning, breadth and depth of services. You know, this is uh, more or less where all the other providers are still at this moment. Of course, we have many more different services available right now. There's also mobile, and there is, of course, we've been listening to you guys, and we deliver these, these things like workspaces and work docs and work mail um, for you, creating a whole very, very rich ecosystem of services for you. Second thing I think that sets us aside is sort of a relentless focus on cost reduction. So we've lowered our pricing uh, 49 times. Yeah, what is it? 49 times since we launched. Um, and there's the, this basically is a flywheel. And this flywheel is if you guys help us create additional economies of scale, obviously we get a lower cost picture. But we also do a lot of infrastructure innovation. We do a lot of innovation in our data centers um, to drive cost down. And then when we achieve a lower cost picture, we'll reduce pricing. Yeah, we see this as a high volume, low margin business, and we're more than happy to keep the margins where they are. And then if we get a lower cost base, then we'll, we'll hand money back to you, basically. Uh, and we also do this uh, on, on in individual basis. Um, if you've never seen this uh, app, this is a tool that we give you. It's called Trusted Advisor that will allow you to run that on your infrastructure, and it will give you advice. Uh, around reliability, around security, and things like that, but also around cost, so that you can drive your individual bill with us down. Yeah, and, and remember, one of the first times when we ran it was on um, infrastructure from a customer in India called Hungama. Uh, they're a Bollywood streaming company. They were one of our earliest customers. I think they were on board since 2008. These, these guys were really, really solid AWS architects. They knew exactly what they were doing. Um, and, um, and what they did when they ran the tool, immediately the month after that, their bill was almost 30% lower. Uh, because they had many things like they had EBS volumes laying around that could be snapshotted and deleted and things like, like that. So we do give that to you. Uh, you know, we, we, we have an iterative uh, uh, innovation process that really takes your information into account or your feedback and then develop these, uh, these new tools such as Redshift and Glacier and Workspaces. Uh, so this is an epic collaboration. Uh, how fast do we move? But we innovate at every level of the stack. Yeah, it's not just that we're innovating in these new services that we deliver to you. Also, in other pieces of the stack, in all areas of the stack, we try to innovate. And so, um, you know, we are growing rapidly, and on a daily basis, we add as much capacity as that the whole of Amazon had um, in 2004 when we were a $7 billion company. This is what we add on a daily basis, 365 days a year. We roll in this capacity, additional capacity, into our regions. Very important in this whole story is to get networks out of the way. If you look at the cost picture in the data center, uh, yes, servers is still the major cost factor, but networking, cost of networking is growing if you don't innovate in, in that world. Yeah, and so if you look at uh, everything that has gone down in terms of cost, CPU has gone down in cost, uh, I.O. has gone down, um, storage has gone down in cost, network ports have either stayed uh, the same or gone up. And the second thing that the problem is with, with the networks is that most of the network devices are black boxes. So you can't automate them. They're really built, the off-the-shelf network boxes are things that you have to log into. And where even when they're the, the, the biggest uh, routers that you can talk about, the F5s and the Junipers and whatever of this world, all of them are non-automatable. 
there were all things that you have to log into. And such at operating these things at scale uh, becomes a liability, also from a reliability point of view. So we've decided to um, actually start building our own networking hardware and also our own networking software to be able to support very large-scale operations such that we do in our data centers. So if you look at the infrastructure now, we have 11 regions around the world, um, 29 availability zones, and we'll get to the definition of an availability zone in a minute, and uh, 52 points of presence, which is our content delivery network for low latency access. Now, if you open up one of those regions, yeah, then uh, such a region will consist of multiple availability zones. Each region has at least two availability zones. Um, available for, for our customers to use, um, uh, but quite often there's three or more availability zones available. Yeah. Um, you look at the, the, how the layout is, we have availability zones and we have two transit centers, at least two transit centers, that uh, fold into the, the, do the traffic towards the uh, availability zones. Yeah. Um, so those, those transit centers also provide us with uh, links directly into the other regions. And they are the peering points where customers come in with their direct connect co connections. And also where customers come in over the regular internet and then traffic is distributed among the AZs. Um, these are typical numbers, well over 80,000 fibers. Um, that we use. Uh, AZs are in general uh, less than two milliseconds apart, but uh, quite often less than one millisecond. And uh, the, the traffic between uh, AZs often exe exceeds the, the 25 terabits per second. Yeah, so why, why, is there, why do we have AZs? Well, um, they, in, in in the old style of development, in the old style of if you wanted to replicate things and make them highly available, you, you might put your data centers in different lo locations. Yeah? Uh, but it turns out that um, really building distributed development uh, across multiple data centers, especially if they're geographically further away, becomes really hard. And so we've decided to place AZs relatively close together However, they need to be in different flood zones, they need to be in different geographical areas, they are connected to different power grids to make sure that they are isolated from each other, but do have high-speed bandwidths available between them such that you can actually run your transactions distributed over multiple AZs. Now, if you look at uh, one of those AZs, yeah, if you go look at them, um, one a single AZ will consist of multiple data centers. It's not, you know, it's easy to think about an AZ as a single data center, but in essence, um, quite frequently, there's multiple a AZs. And uh, it's, we have some AZs, um, actually you said 28, we have now 29 availability zones. Um, yeah, we, we have a number of AZs that actually consist of six or more data centers. Yeah, and those data centers are, closed, are put very closely together. The number here is uh, a quarter of a millisecond apart from each other. We, um, a typical data center in our case holds 50,000 to 80,000 servers. Yeah. Um, it is, uh, it's undesirable to have data centers that are larger than that, and it has to do with what we call the blast radius. Uh, meaning that you know, the data center still is a unit of failure. Uh, it, it might actually take some work to, break, uh, to bring a data center down, but um, there, are, there are scenarios under which this can happen. And the larger you build your data centers, then the more servers you have in it, um, the larger impact such a failure could have. Uh, and so we, uh, we really try to uh, reduce the size of data centers to uh, less than 100,000 servers per data center. Um, within a single data center, we have uh, our own network layout, and uh, a typical is well over, uh, well over 100 terabytes per second, uh, sorry, terabits per second uh, within, a single, uh, the, um, within a single data center. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, all the, all the networking equipment within that data center has been uh, built 
um, for us to, towards our specifications, and it runs our own software stack to make sure that we are as efficient as possible. Now, if you uh, take a look at, uh, at one of those data centers, yeah, then of course you have, uh, as we said, man, many racks in there. Um, and one of the uh, challenges, of course, that we've had, if you continue to look at the network, that uh, virtualization, by its nature, creates uh, overhead. Yeah, especially if you run multiple uh, VM instances on a single node and they have a shared network, um, then there is something which is called the, uh, the single root I.O. virtualization, no, the, the, the virtualization tax, uh, which you can solve by using a technique that's called uh, uh, single root I.O. virtualization. And, and what, what does that mean? It basically means that you move the I.O., that you move the networking I.O. out of the VM. And so we run the networking stack on individual boards for our customers such that they are removed from the virtualization layer. And this gives you uh, much lower latency and more importantly, much less variability uh, with respect to the networking. And if you look at the networking, um, over time, the older, the yellow bars are, the, uh, are before we were using uh, the separate networking boards in our, uh, in our, in our servers. Um, and you see that, uh, especially at the, uh, the 99 and the 99.9 percentile and the 100 percentile, um, the network variability was really high. And this has to do just with contention between VMs and the networking. And the, um, the pink ones is uh, what is actually happening, the variability in the network layer, now that we've moved networking out of the VMs but into um, into these separate boards. So as you can see, this kind of innovation really helps reduce the latency and reduce the jitter, and that's most important. Yeah? Uh, I think you can have, devices can be, ex or, or you can have extreme high uh, I.O. capabilities, um, but what you want out of your network is predictability. Yeah? If, if you have predictable performance, then you can build against that. And I think the newer networking uh, setup that we've created really give you this, uh, this uh, low latency, but most importantly, very low jitter. Uh, yes, we build our own servers, of course. Um, yes, we could have bought, we, we, could, we could buy, let's say, off-the-shelf uh, servers, but they are, uh, they're very expensive and they're very, not only expensive, they are very, what shall I say, uh, general purpose. Yeah, it was hard for us to actually start uh, to make use of these truly generic uh, sort of off-the-shelf servers and start giving you high I.O. or give you high CPU or give you GPU work, work workloads. And as such, um, we're building a custom uh, storage and custom, uh, ser custom servers uh, to make sure that we can address exactly those workloads. And we've worked together with Intel uh, to make uh, Haswell processors available that run at much higher clock rates than others. And for example, in, and they are in the new C4s. I think, is it called C4? Yeah. Yeah, in the C4s, they run the Has Haswell processors. In the M4s, also have a version of that available right now. So we can run them, first of all, at much higher clock rates. But also, the I.O. Uh, infrastructure in those servers actually give you much higher networking capabilities uh, than that some of the other instance types have. And as such, it allows us to build dedicated server types for, to support the, your very specific workloads that you may have in compute or in I.O. or in, in just large disk infrastructures. We also do it for storage. This is uh, one of our uh, storage racks. Uh, it has, uh, what is it, close to 900 disks in it, and it actually weighs two and a half tons. Yeah? Um, these things are, um, it's, it's difficult to bring those into your data center. But they've been built specifically for support cases such as ELB and S3 to make sure that we can have them not only highly available, but also can create them at a cost point that we can actually drive the cost of storage for you down. Um, and of course, it's not just uh, around info power, it's not just around um, networking and around storage and CPUs, 
power infrastructure within your data center is an extremely important one. Yeah, uh, because it often determines the availability, the highly, avail uh, highly avail high availability of the individual com components. This is also, in my eyes, the piece that fails um, the most. Yeah, um, it turns out that uh, these, these, net, these power grids are uh, not as reliable as that you would think. And so, as such, within each of those data centers, yeah, we, we will have our own generators to make sure that we keep our data centers highly available. Um, a, a good example there is uh, we, we had one outage at one moment, or we didn't have an outage. So there is lightning that hits a transformer somewhere that takes away uh, the power that comes into the data center. We go over onto diesel. There's multiple diesel generators per data center. Um, and then in one of those data center rooms, um, you know, the fan is actually turning not fast enough for some reason. Temperature in that room rises, generator shuts down automatically. But we've built a system for that such that it can fail over to a backup of the backup generator. And so on the servers themselves and on the server racks, we've, we did innovation such that we can actually switch in, 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 in microseconds between two power sources without the servers actually going down. And so one thing here to say is also that we actually have a, uh, a very strong move towards being 100% carbon neutral. At this moment, of, or at least using renewable energy. We have a number of regions that are, uh, um, that are carbon neutral. So you, Oregon, uh, Gulf Cloud, also, which is also on the West Coast, as well as Frankfurt, are 100% uh, carbon neutral. But also, we've recently made investments in actually generating um, renewable energy ourselves. So we have uh, investments going on into creating a wind farm in, um, in Indiana that will deliver, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 80 megawatts. Uh, and we'll have a, a solar farm that we're building. Uh, the, the wind farm will probably go into production in early 2016. Um, and we'll have a, a solar farm that will go into production, I don't know, I think at the end of 2016, and that will deliver 170 megawatts. Yeah? Now, I don't know if you know how power systems work. I mean, you can't have them power you directly, but basically this renewable energy goes into the grid in, uh, in Indiana and in, uh, uh, and in Virginia. And, and as such, we're, we're contributing to building renewable energy systems. So I hope that I've given you a bit of a glimpse about what's happening under the, under the covers in, in data centers uh, in AWS. And I thank you all for uh, coming out here uh, today, the whole day, and especially in this last session here to, to, to today. Uh, and with that, I thank you for coming here and uh, hope to see you next year. Thank you. Thank you.